he doing now? We're going to find out. All right, everyone, welcome back. So if you were watching earlier, we had a little technical glitch. I'm not sure what happened, but we're rolling now, everyone. And we're going to make mugs. We have a mug making tutorial. I am going to talk about templates. We're going to talk about mugs. We're going to talk about glazes. I mentioned earlier some new clay share classes coming, plus the hundreds of classes we already have. So check that out. Now, um, I did int I'll introduce myself, Jessica Putnam Phillips, c'est moi, uh, and I'm here every Wednesday at 5, usually as long as we don't have technical issues, because this week we did, and I'm a little later than 5, so here we are. Anyways, we're still going to make a mug, and we're going to do it from Clay Slabs, and I do have this class available on Clayshare and on YouTube, so you could watch it at either of those places, it is free. But you can watch it here now with me. If you have any questions, ask me now. Concerns, that's what I'm here for. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about mugs. It can be just be, out po be about pottery in general. So I have before me six mugs that I've made from slabs using different textures, using different glazes. And I wanted to share with you these combos before we started going. You know, if you watched my live kiln opening, which you can now check the replay out on the Clayshare app, clayshare.com, Facebook, Vimeo, we've got that up, and on YouTube. Um, you'll notice that in the live kiln opening, we had a little bit of an issue with a glaze fit. Glazes didn't like each other, so we had cracking. And then a few days later, other pieces cracked as well. So um, good news is none of these pieces here have cracked. They're all good. So are, are we up? I, um, we're, so we we seem to be back on OTT. We're back on OTT. Yay! But now Facebook and YouTube. Facebook and YouTube. Yeah. So where can you buy the textured rolling pins? They are available from Claysharemarket.com, and I have my own line that I designed. I don't make the pins, but you can buy my designs. And Sharon Hoppy is also a designer, and she has her pins. Now I'm going to show you some of the designs that I have available. This is a rolling pin I made myself. This is a textured rolling pin. It's a clay share class. You make your own bisque rolling pin. It's really a fabulous little thing and I used it here on this clay slab. I actually made this while I was at Haystack Mountain School of Crafts over on Deer Isle, Maine for Veteran Craft Week. So I went there and I got to spend a fabulous week making pottery, teaching other veterans how to make pottery. It was really a great week. I loved it. And we made mugs. Everybody made a lot of mugs. Some of you out there might have met me then and, you know, have known me since we did that. I think now that's, that was uh, two years ago now. I think we did that. So that was, that was fun. This clay here is by Sheffield Pottery and the glaze is Clayscape Shadow Blue. And then on top, the second glaze is Clayscape's Cream. So it's two glazes layered on. So that gives that effect. Now, the next two mugs have the same glaze. This is my Orbe. It's a beautiful grass green glaze that I brought down from cone 10 to cone 6, which I technically fire at cone 5, but it still works at cone 5, and it's a lovely translucent glaze. And then the rim is just iron oxide, red iron oxide brushed on the rim on this one. And then this one I did the rim and the handle just because I wanted to play with contrast. The clay on both of these is Laguna B-Mix 5 with no grog. And the patterns, this is my succulent pattern on this one. Cute, cute. And this is the holiday one I did um, around, around the holidays. Surprise, surprise, right? What else do we got going here? This is another one of my glazes. This is my cobblestone. And this is one of my favorite glazes, and it's usually very reliable. I don't usually have any issues with it at all. So I have cobblestone on the inside, cobblestone on the outside, and then over dipped with my spearmint, which these are both available from clayscapespottery.com, so you can buy these glazes. They're dippable glazes, and they're included in the giveaway for this month. And I have to say, I did some pieces using my cobblestone on the inside, and the glazes on the outside just did not like it. We had some severe um, cracking on those pieces, but that's, you know, that happens. And then another glaze I love is my Lake Blue. It's on the inside of both of these mugs. Now, the outside is Smoky Merlot in Iron Luster from Amico. So that's what this one is. And then this is like its lighter 
its little lighter sister, right? You know, it's just a little lighter one. This is Lavender Mist from Mako with their Light Flux. So that's what this is on here. Gorgeous combo, right? I love this. I love these so much. And I love them together. These glazes actually like each other and they layer lovely. So that's just some combos. And one thing you wanna think about when you're picking out glazes for pots that have texture is you wanna make sure the glaze is translucent enough to show that texture. If you use a really opaque thick glaze, it'll hide a lot of what you've worked so hard to create and you don't want that. So I'm just gonna scooch these all off to the side. Oh, um, the texture on this one is my lattice flourish design. That's this one. Oh, this one was my Southwest pin. Love that one. That is one of my ultimate favorites. Love them all, but that one is a good one. And then that's my layered ginkgo. Such, such a good one if you like ginkgos. All right, so I think we're gonna go ahead and get on with the baking, people, because the mugs won't make themselves, sadly. <laughs> That doesn't work. You might leave your clay out thinking little pottery elves are gonna show up and make you some mugs, but they won't. So um, I have discovered over the years that there's some great shortcuts that you can use to make pots. And right here is one of my tricks. I use craft foam to make templates. This is a four inch by 12 inch, and this makes the body of the mug. And then I use a four inch cookie cutter for the bottom. So that's how I get perfectly round bottoms like that, using the cookie cutter. So I see there's a question on how do you get the best drips? Well, it depends on the glazes. Some glazes just run and melt lovely and make this gorgeous drippy yumminess, like the cream glaze here on top of my of um, Shadow Blue from Clayscapes Pottery. They just love each other and the cream just melts and looks so good. Other drips you can get by using products like Mako makes their fluxes. They have a light flux and a dark flux. And those, if you put them on the rim, they tend to run down and, and kind of pull the glaze too. And it's just a really lovely effect. I have found that with Amico, their Iron Luster, which is on the rim of this, does a similar thing. And so usually you'll do an over dip of another color and that over dip will just pull down the glazes and melt a bit and give you a bit of that run and drippiness. And it's just really yummy. I think it's really yummy. So that's, this is what we're gonna use. Now, a couple other things I like. A lot of times when we hand build mugs, yes, we know it's hand built and we know it's not gonna be perfectly round. You know, it's handmade, but you wanna kinda keep it round. So what I like to do is use a little terracotta flower pot in the making and that will help it, I call it a rounder, but it'll help it stay round. And that way we don't have such bad warping issues with it. And this right here is a four inch terracotta pot. So is it true Mako glaze don't run? It sounds like which one, it, it, okay, so it sounds like the one with the mug I showed is not true. I'm not, okay, I'm not following you, but Mako glazes, some of them will run, some don't. It depends on the glaze. Like their crystal glazes like to run. If you add the flux on top, so I see, so when you say light or dark, dark flux, they change color as well. Right, so this, those two questions can go together really nicely. A lot of companies make glazes that are brush on. Brush on glazes are usually very stable. They don't tend to flow so much, as opposed to dippable glazes. Dippable glazes usually tend to flow more. It's just how they're formulated. Now, brush on glazes, a lot of companies have come out with glazes to go on top or that work really well with them and that'll help them flux a little more, flow a bit more, melt. And so Mako has a product called their Mako Flux and they have a light and a dark version. So there's two different fluxes. And if you put the light on a glaze, same glaze, put the dark on, you'll get two different looks. So it just changes the color of the glaze, melts it a little bit and gives you that drippiness on the rim. So you could try one glaze with light flux, same glaze, dark flux, and get two different looks. So that's, that's how it is. Now, Amico Celadon line is pretty stable. It doesn't, it doesn't melt very much, it stays put. If you put a flux on top, that'll help it run. Mako has some, um, the fluxes, which you can use on Amico glazes, that's fine. And Amico makes a glaze called oatmeal that likes to run a bit, and they have a glaze called seaweed that really likes to run a lot too. 
I shared a photo of a mug I made, which I don't own because I sold it, but that has um, deep sea, which is a celadon, and on its own, the deep sea won't melt very much. It stays put, but I put seaweed on top and it melted down the sides and looked gorgeous. Yeah, I, so some of you have seen that I did have quite a few mugs crack during glaze testing. This is part of testing and I actually like it when that happens because I want to know if a glaze is going to fail or crack before I send it out into the world. I definitely don't want to recommend using glazes that crack and I don't want to sell a piece that has glazes on it that could crack down the line. Now, the glazes I used, some I'd used before and they've been fine, but not together. It was the combination of everything and lots of layers and lots of glaze that caused that to crack. So uh, I'm gonna do more testing with them and, and we'll see what happens. We'll see where it goes. So I think we're ready to move on. I've got some clay over here. I've already rolled out a slab, about three eighths of an inch thick. It's, a, it's too thick for a mug. We're gonna thin it down, but I start thicker and then I can go ahead and thin it down and work with what I get. So I'm just gonna grab that. So here's a bit of clay. So I think we can switch our view so that we can be at the, the overhead for you all to see what I'm doing. It'll just be better. Except for you folks on Instagram, you're gonna get the front view because Instagram doesn't let us do the picture in picture. It just doesn't let us. So this is a clay slab I've rolled out on my slab roller. Like I said, it's 3 eighths of an inch thick, which if you're making platters or large pieces, this is actually a really good thickness. It's fabulous for that. But for a mug, we wanna thin it down to about a quarter of an inch and it will shrink on its own. It will continue shrinking, but it's, it's a little too thick to go right now. So we're gonna smooth it down and it will stretch a little bit and we're gonna smooth both sides out. So there's one side. Someone just commented on the, by the way, we're only on the app for Live at Five. That's right. Facebook we're, and YouTube said no. Facebook, right. So if you're watching this, it's only on the app and on Instagram. Facebook and YouTube are not working for whatever reason. And this is why we have live broadcasting capability on the ClayShare app so that you all can watch because we cannot rely on Facebook and YouTube for our broadcasts. We have to rely on ourselves. And luckily we do that, we can do that. So I've smoothed this out. And just got a uh, premium membership for her birthday. Ho ho, so you're able to watch on the app. Well, the, the Live at Five broadcasts are free for everybody, but we do a private broadcast on the app for premium members. And that happens right after this broadcast ends. And you don't have to do anything, it'll just show up. It'll be there and you'll get to watch it. So it's beautiful, we love that. And the private broadcast is a chance for ClayShare Premium members to ask me questions, talk about past classes, any issues they're having in making. If they um, you know, want advice on equipment, I get asked a lot about buying wheels and kilns and such. So on the app, can you favorite videos or classes for future reference? Like if you want to, yes. Yeah, so Yeah, you have a, a list that you can add them to. You have a list, you, yeah, you can add them to. So that if you're going through and you're like, oh, I like this one, oh, I like that one, oh, I like this one too, you can add them to your list. And that way you can go back and watch them later. Because there's a lot of good classes and I always try to share um, like featured classes every day or every other day. I don't wanna overwhelm everybody, but I'm trying to you know, keep you guys going and keep you interested and get those creative juices flowing and give you ideas and keep making. All right, so we've rolled out our slab. I've smoothed it out. It's ready for me to add my texture to it now. Whatever you decide to use for texture is perfectly fine or you don't have to add texture at all. You could leave it, it's fine. You could totally leave it alone. I'm gonna use my B rolling pin and I'm gonna roll it in and I'm not using my steps tool because <laughs> I usually do because I'm five feet two and it's very difficult for short, just short ladies to um, get that downward pressure, right? So look at this, I have a really cute pattern. The B rolling pin is omnidirectional. I get requests all the time to make omnidirectional pieces and the B rolling pin is 
and we're going to line this up. Now I can get two bees out of this one. I can get one at the top and I can get one down at the bottom. So we're going to make one. Top, do we have enough for our, oh, so close. We're going to save that. I'll roll another, I'll roll another slab. So for cutting out your walls, you're going to hold your knife straight up and down and you're just going to cut straight across. Top cut and do the same at the bottom. And then for your sides, you're going to do a side bevel. So just hold this knife approximately at 45 degree angle, but it doesn't really matter. Just hold the same angle so that they will overlap each other and that'll help us make our walls. So here we have the wall for the mug. Now we're going to go ahead and make the bottom. Let me grab another little bit of clay. So when you're making slab pieces and you're using a lot of texture, you have some choices. You can go ahead and add texture on your bottoms and then use a bisque stamp that you make with your own initials on it and that can be how you sign it. Oftentimes when I wheel throw pottery, I will use underglaze and I will carve my name into it. But when I do textured pieces like this, I'll use the rolling pin or whatever texture I'm using on the bottom and then use my stamp and that's how I sign those. It's just a really nice way to personalize it, sign it, and have gorgeous texture on the bottom too. So let's go back with this same rolling pin. There. Perfect B in the middle. So for your bottom, we're going to use a four inch cookie cutter. And that's a perfect circle. And what I love about this pattern here is I got the little honeycombs and my little stamp is going to fit perfectly in a honeycomb. We're going to put it in this one. Look at it, right in there. So cute. Love it. All right, so now we're going to grab our banding wheel and we're going to work on that. Actually, we're going to turn this over. We're going to sit this on the banding wheel. Let's roll up our wall first. So we have the wall. Take our slip. And I'm not, I'm not reading comments. I'm not really seeing any comments come through. So if you guys have questions for me, please ask. So we're going to overlap. So we've got a lovely overlap there. And we're just going to go ahead and I kind of roll it up just like that. And then on the inside, what I will do is I'll smooth that seam out with my red rib. So right now we don't have a lot of people commenting because unlike Facebook where the comments are like right beside the video or just on top of the video, you actually have to scroll down a little bit, make the video smaller to, uh. to do the apps. To, to do the comments in the app, so I think everybody's focused on watching more. Than <laughs> That's right okay. Now. You can be watching. As a beginner, you're very overwhelmed by large amount of glazes out there. I can understand that it is, there's way too many. So when I started making pottery 20 years ago, there wasn't that, there was not commercial glazes. You had to make your own glazes. So you were a little limited in what you could have for glazes. Now, the world is your oyster and you can use any glaze you want. What I suggest is you find two or three pieces you see that have been made somewhere. Like you, someone shared a post and you love the way that glaze looks. And then get that glaze and try that on your pieces and see if you like it. If you like that glaze, then find another glaze similar to that and get that glaze and, you know, go that way. That's what I suggest. Oh, you just got an email saying your GR pottery forms are in. Fabulous. So do I recommend glazing greenware and firing it to save time and money? I do not recommend doing that. Uh, you know, unless you do that professionally and have a lot of experience, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with that. And uh, it's just not the best way to do it. You're not really saving time and money if, you're, if everything in your kiln blows up and you lose the kiln full of pots. So I always do a bisque fire, then I glaze and do a glaze fire. Now, there are potters who do just single fire all the time. 
and they've been doing it successfully, successfully for years. And it can be done, but I don't recommend it starting out, no. So I got a quick one. Sure. What were the dimensions again for the wall? She missed it again. She missed it coming <laughs> over from YouTube. Sure. It's a four inch by 12 inch rectangle that I cut out from a piece of craft foam and I use a four inch cookie cutter. Do you see how I write everything on my templates? Because if I don't write that on there, uh, it will be lost because I don't remember. <laughs> do I use cornstarch for the rolling pins? I don't know, but I know some people do. Um, yeah, you can use cornstarch if you want to brush things down to help prevent sticking. I only do that when I'm using um, something like a really, really sticky plastic one. And even then I like to use spray, like Pam, spray non-stick cooking spray. <laughs> okay, here comes a question. Yay, people figured it out. Uh, how do you stop it from getting distorted? The mug. Yes. So as we're making it, you know, we're trying to keep it in the round. We're not really warping it too much, but we will use this as a rounder. So we're gonna, you're going to see, we're going to make it, we're going to do it. So we're about to put the bottom on and I just have to decide which way I want this to face. And I think that's going to be the top. This is going to be the bottom. That's the biggest decision you make is you got to pick the top or the bottom. So slip and score your bottom. And then how long have you let it dry? I rolled this slab out at four o'clock and I had it covered with plastic sitting on my slab roller waiting for me to work. And then I started the broadcast and rolled my texture and you saw that. So it sat for maybe an hour and 20 minutes. And now after the piece will be made, I will let it sit for covered in plastic, oh, at least a week or two, because this is Laguna B mix and it's a porcelainous clay, so it's prone to cracking. So I want to let this dry nice and evenly and slowly away from any heat or drafts or air conditioning units. So you see how I lined that up and now I'm just using my finger to make sure it's in the round for the bottom. We're going to get to the top. So that's on. Now I'm going to use my finger and I'm just going to spin this along. And Sandra asked where she could find the video for the sweater mug and I just dropped a reply onto her comment with that link. Thanks Sandra. So yeah, there, that's a class on ClayShare. That's on the app and on ClayShare.com. So you can watch that there. You can also watch it on Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV or Roku if you have those. You can also Chromecast our ClayShare classes um, or screencast it too. So I'm going to take this one quarter inch brush and I'm just going to swirl it on the inside to seal that seam. And people always ask, don't you use a coil down there? Not for a mug. I don't and I have never had a seam pop on me. I just smooth everything out and I've sealed the outside up really well. And another little thing I like to do is I will use my yellow rib and just kind of scooch that along the outside. And that really helps seal everything up too. And the last thing I'll do for finishing the outside is we have a really nice mug that's just like straight to the tabletop, right? That's, it'll just go straight like that. Mugs look better when they have a little undercut. It lifts them up a bit. Basically any pottery looks better when you can lift it up. So do I ever use a butt joint? So if you do a butt joint, what can happen is when you go to add volume, it will pop open. So a bevel joint shouldn't be thick because it should overlap nicely because you cut a bevel on each side. It shouldn't really be any thicker than the clay around it. Your bevel will take care of that. And if you line it up perfectly, you won't have it to be too thick. So if you're finding your bevel is a little too thick, then maybe you've overlapped too much. But another thing you can do if you're finding that you're having some thickness issues is you can just take your finger here on the seam and just kind of roll it up. And if you get a little bump at the top, you can just cut that off because what you've done is you rolled that excess clay, that thickness up, and you can just take it away. Now, this one worked out perfectly. I don't have a bump there and the thickness is even, but if you're having that as an issue, go ahead and give that a try. So that leads right into this one. On the, on the next mug you cut, please show a close-up of beveling the edges so that they fit nice together. 
Well, we'll do the best we can. I, um, we're limited for this class, but if you check out the class on ClayShare, you'll see it, and that's a free class. It's also on YouTube. And all of my classes that I do that are hand-built with slabs, I always bevel, and you see it on the classes. So you can watch that there. But because this is a live broadcast and we're not able to stop and move cameras and reposition everything, we have two views right now. We have the full view and we have the overhead view. And that's really all I can do. And I can't zoom. I can zoom the overhead view in, but that won't help you see a close-up of the bevel. Um, but go check out the class. That will help you. Uh, and then the next one, uh, do you put handles on hand-built mugs right away or do you wait for the next day? Right away. Don't wait. So actually, my process for making a hand-built mug is, is kind, of, kind of different than most mug making processes or processes. So usually I will pull my handles before I even make a mug. I'll pull all my handles, I'll have them sitting drying, and then I'll make my mugs. That way, when I'm done making the mug, I can attach the handle to it. It's ready. Because these mugs aren't wet. They're dry. They're a nice, soft slab, but they're not, um, they're not wet like a wheel thrown mug is. So now we're just going to smooth the edge here, and then we're going to use the rounder. And I'm not worrying about this being out of round right now. We're going to fix that. What we're doing is we're compressing our rim. We're rounding it over, smoothing everything out getting a nice edge now and taking care of that part. Mm -hmm. Oh, you missed it being rolled out. I'll roll, I'll roll another one if we have time. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. We go to 6, so I don't know what time it is. Well, I know we were 5.48. So we're running a little late. I don't know if I'll be able to get a second one, but um, I'll do more with the B-pin. And actually, if you're a premium member, during prime time, guess what we're doing, folks, tonight? <laughs> we're making mugs <laughs> because I got a lot of mugs that need to be made. All right, here's, here's one that's actually a couple. Uh, thinking of investing in the new Advancer kiln, kiln shelves, mm. any comments? And what's the best way to store clay? It's too hot in my she shed here in Arizona. Okay, so the Advancer kiln shelves are fabulous. I do like them a lot. They're expensive, so if you're gonna invest in them, maybe just do one shelf at a time. The great thing about them is they're silicone carbide, they're very lightweight, and basically, you don't really have to put kiln wash on them, and they're great at getting glaze off, so they're a little easier to work with, but they're very expensive, and their big, big draw is they're so light, because they're very thin, and they don't warp. So that's, um, you know, what, that's why people love them. I don't have any. <laughs> Advancer kiln shelves, they are a pricey item, and I would need a lot of shelves. Um, and, you know, I just haven't gotten to the point where I'm ready to invest, but if you are, I certainly encourage it. Uh, I think they make a great kiln shelf. Maybe I should look at getting some, you know. And what was the second question? Uh, tips on storing clay. Because storing clay. In our shed so, in we don't have the hot issue in Vermont, we have the opposite. We have the cold issue, because you don't really want your clay to freeze. So what we have done in years past when we've had issues with the studio heat heater, we have a pellet stove that heats the barn. And in the middle of January, we get down to negative 20. That's daytime temperatures. So, uh, so I guess we get down further than that. But we'll have daytime temperatures negative 20. And you cannot leave clay in that temperature. That, you, you, it's terrible. So what we have done in years past is we've taken the clay in the house and stored it you know, sometimes in our basement, sometimes in our kitchen. It's a little inconvenient, but it's just for the winter and we just work around it. My suggestion would be find a place inside your home that's climate controlled to keep the clay and then take it out as you need it and use it. And, um, you know, that should help. So I just put this little clay pot in here and I'm just pressing the sides against it and that helps put it into round. How do you apply kiln wash to your kiln shelves? So when you first get your kiln shelf, if you're buying a regular alumina kiln shelf, you're going to take your kiln shelf out of your studio or maybe someplace in your studio and you apply it with a brush so it's liquid and you brush it on. And I actually have a class on making your own kiln wash and applying it to shelves. So that's, I got a class for you. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So this is in here now. I can just take it out. I don't have to leave it in. And then we can let this set. If this is going to have no um, volume added to it, 
I can leave it alone. If I want to add volume to that, I can do that now. Um, I don't know if I want to though. I kind of like it like this. Um, I'm doing a, a smoothing of the join right here called celebrating the join. Now, I did not pull handles before the broadcast because I was so busy getting ready. But normally in my making, I will pull handles. So let's quickly roll um, out a coil and pull it into a handle. So we'll do that fast. I've got a couple of questions on handles for you. Perfect timing. One is, do you ever extrude handles? Mm, yeah. And, okay. Let's start with that. Pause for, so let me do this one at a time. Do I ever extrude handles? Yes. I think extruding handles is fabulous if you have an extruder and you have a, a die that you can use. Um, yeah, I think extruded handles are a great way for making. Not everybody has access to that, so it's um, a little more limited, but if you do, give it a try. Yeah, I think they're great. And the next question? Um, the next one was for, so for that mug, what length handle would you pull? I'm gonna pull about six to seven inch handle, but I'll probably cut it down closer to five and a half inches, but it all depends. I never have one standard size handle for any mug. I usually vary them because everybody has different size hands. And some people like to hold a mug with one finger, some like two, some like to put three fingers in. Some people don't even hold it by the handle at all, so they don't even care. So for me, I'm a three finger in the mug girl. I wanna be able to put three of my fingers in this mug to hold it. That's how I like to hold a mug. If it has a teeny little handle and I can only put two fingers in, I just, I feel like I'm gonna drop it. So for me, I like a tiny bit more space in there. But if you're somebody who wants just a single finger mug, then you wouldn't need to make such a big loop. And plus, the other aspect is somebody who has small hands versus somebody that has large hands. So I like three fingers in my mug and I have small hands. If somebody likes three, a three finger mug and they have big hands, they'll need a bigger handle. So those are all things that when we're making pieces, we need to think about the user. It's not just about us and what we like, um, it's also about the end owner, right? We have to think about them and how they're gonna like it. So if you're making custom pieces particularly, you need to notice people's hands. <laughs> if they have great big hands, they're gonna want bigger handles. If they have little hands, they'll want smaller handles and you can always ask people how they hold their handles. So I have a tutorial on pulling handles. I believe it's a free tutorial, Cal. Is it free? I think it's free. It's a three step, and I show this all the time, way of pulling handles. Guarantee if you do this, you'll be able to make handles. So many people think they cannot make a handle. You can make a handle. So we're gonna start, took my coil, kind of flattened it. You see I just pulled straight down. We do a thumb pull, fingers behind, thumb in the front, pull straight down and I'll flip that around and do both sides. And then you pull, make a U with your hands, and you grab the sides and you pull. And then scissor pull, do a scissor motion and then pull. And so these three motions combined will help you make a handle that will be well made, feel nice for the user, and easy to do. So after, after you glaze them, can they go in the microwave? Yes. After you glaze and fire them, you can put them in the microwave. Yes. As long as you don't use gold luster or any kind of metallic material on it, you'll be fine in the microwave. You love the unicorn bucket. I know. <laughs> so the unicorn bucket started out because I appropriated it from one of my daughters. And then now every year at Easter time, I'll go after Easter when they have extras and buy them on sale and use them throughout the year. Um, because they're so cute. So here's our handle. It's crazy long, but it's okay because we're going to let it dry. I'm just going to fold it up like this, sit it down here. Actually, we'll put it on a little board so I can put it off to the side. So I'll usually make these first, make my handles first, let them set up. There it is. There it's setting. It's doing its handle thing and air is able to get to it and you can see how it's drying. Now, if you're making mugs and it's taking a little while to make your mugs, you don't want your handles to dry out. I know my workflow and I know how fast it takes for me to make a handle and for me to make a mug. So I know I can make a batch of handles, sit them on the side, make a batch of mugs and attach them in a session without the handles getting too dry. So if you find your handles are getting too dry, just after you make them, cover them lightly with plastic while they're sitting there and you're working on your mugs. 
And if your mugs are drying out too much, after you make a mug, cover that with plastic while you work on your handles. Just, it's all about timing and pottery. The success of making in pottery is 100% timing. Putting attachments together, adding your joins at the right time, rolling up your pieces at the right time, all that, it has to do with timing to get it right. Got another question? Speaking of timing. Yes. Do you let your slab harden up a bit before you shape with it? Hmm. So for these, um, it depends on the clay I'm using. The B-Mix that I use is a little wet when it comes out. If your clay is a little dry, you might not need to let it set up. But yeah, I let it set for, if I'm not covering with plastic, about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. But if your studio is really hot or really dry, then you're gonna want to not do that because it might dry out fast. fast. And I do want to make a mention with B-Mix because I've seen some people commenting they're struggling with it. B-Mix is a porcelainous clay. Clays with porcelain dry faster. They dry faster than other clays. So if you're using them and you're having issues with cracking, the pieces are drying. This is drying right now much faster than if I had just a regular stoneware clay. So just keep that in mind when you're working. And if you're having a lot of cracking, you either want to cover this and let it dry slower, or you can try another clay. You don't have to use B-Mix. I used another clay for, I made my own clay for 10 years, and then I discovered B-Mix. I don't make my own clay anymore because I don't want to have to mix hundreds of pounds of clay every week. I'd rather buy it, but there's plenty of other great clays out there. It's just, this is one I love to use. So do I always test clays on mugs rather than test tiles? I do, and you want to know why? And let's talk about why I'd rather do a, a mug test tile than a flat test tile. So, when you're doing a test tile that's maybe a flat piece that's standing up, you basically have a flat tile. You're not getting a curve, you're not really having an inside and an outside, and those things really affect how a glaze can look and how a glaze can melt. Glazes that, if you put the same glaze on the inside of a piece as you put on the outside, they can look totally different. It's just how they are. So for me, I like to test on a cup or a mug. Doesn't have to be a mug with a handle. You could make small little cups. I have a class on making um, little shooters or juice cups. They're small, they're easy to make, and it's just enough of a form that you can test glazes and really get a feel for what they look like. A test tile, it's, you do not get enough information from a test tile. It's little, it's hard to really see how it's gonna melt and flow down the piece. You know, this, I really get the feel for this glaze on this piece. Looking at this, I can really tell how the glaze will melt. I can tell how the glaze underneath looks. If I had a little test tile, I would have just a snippet of this, and it's not enough information for me to go forward. Um, a test tile is a great thing to do first, just if you're trying making your glazes for the first time. Sure, but if you really want to get a feel of it, you're going to have to do a test piece before you do a whole line. So you could do test tiles and then, oh, that looks good. Glaze one piece with that glaze. Don't, don't do a kiln full, glaze one and see if it looks good on that one piece. If it does, then do all your other pieces that you want to do with it. The problem with going off a test tile and saying it looks great is it's just too small, not enough info. So hopefully that, that helps answer that question. Yeah, I like using cups and mugs and I know it's a, it's a lot of work to make them, but I find that I get the information I need from them. So yeah, I keep doing that. So where are we at for time? It's time. It's time. So there we have it. I'm not gonna have time to attach the handle, but if you go check out my class on making a mug, so basically this cylinder, uh, it will shrink 12%. It will not be this big. It'll end up being this big. You see the difference? That's huge. So a lot of people will see my mugs and they're like, that's a giant mug, it's too big. But no, it's not. Because look at how much it shrinks. Look at, how, this is a good size mug. This is like the kind of mug that will fit just about everything you want to drink in it. So it'll shrink down to about here. And the handle, I'll, it'll look just like this. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining me. There will be a broadcast for premium members on the app, so you can just go check that out. If you don't have the app, you can go to clayshare.com and watch it there as well, right? Are we on clayshare.com too? That's working. Mm -hmm. It's just not working on um, Facebook. Facebook and YouTube. Just not doing it. And I'm sorry for all the folks that were trying to watch there. 
I must apologize. Now, next week is the Clayscapes Pottery Glaze Giveaway. I just want to remind everybody, premium members are automatically entered in all of our giveaways. If you are not a premium member and you still want to be entered, you can do that. Just go to clayshare.com and sign up for our emails. And guess what? You're entered. Easy. So I will announce the winners next Wednesday at 5. And we'll talk about Clayscapes glazes because I tell you, they have a ton of glazes. Not only do they carry the line of glazes that I've designed and that I use and make, they also have their own glazes, which are pretty phenomenal. So you have to go check those out. I think you'll love them. All right, everyone. Be well, stay safe, and I will see you next week. Bye.